Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. You probably know by now, especially if you've seen us before, that we're studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is for the last three months of 2013. In fact, this is the last lesson, and we wish you a Happy New Year. Having said that, lesson number 13 of this series is entitled Exhortations from the Sanctuary. If by chance you would like to look at the same materials that we look at, and we have our discussions, they're available on our website at theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. And so, let's jump into our discussion, but before we do that, of course, let's ask the Lord to guide us. Our kind and wonderful Father, what can we say after such a series of lessons so many things to learn from so many parts of the Bible, and now we come to the exhortations that we should learn from this portion of the book of Hebrews. May we understand it, grasp the truth that's there for us, and learn how to live it is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we will try to summarize some of the important things that we have learned from our lessons during the last three months. We will do so by focusing on Hebrews 10, 19 to 25. That's a, a kind of a summary passage in some respects. The book of Hebrews, as you probably know, is the Christian's interpreter for the sanctuary system of the Old Testament. It suggests that theology has practical implications. What we know about God should lead to changes in how we live our lives. So let's go and let's just have a look at that passage. Hebrews 10, 19 to 25, and I'm reading from the Good News Bible. We have then, my brothers and sisters, complete freedom to go into the most holy place by means of the death of Jesus. Now, if you have any knowledge about things in the Old Testament at all, you know that this is a huge change. Who was supposed to go into the most holy place in the Old Testament? The high priest. Nobody except the high priest. And only once a year. And yeah. only once a year. He opened us, that's Christ, he opened for us a new way, a living way through the curtain that is through his own body. We have a great high priest in charge of the house of God. So let us come near to God with a sincere heart and a sure faith, with hearts that have been purified from a guilty conscience and with bodies washed with clean water. Let us hold on firmly to the hope we profess because we can trust God to keep his promise. Let us be concerned for one another, to help one another to show love and to do good. Let us not give up the habit of meeting together, as some are doing. Instead, let us encourage one another all the more, since you see that the day of the Lord is coming nearer. So those are the verses. What can we learn from them? Well, interesting little bit of trivia. In Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, um, not to suggest that this is written in Hebrew. This is written in Greek, but it's the book of Hebrews. This is one long sentence. Paul particularly loved long sentences. There's a chapter in Ephesians where almost the entire chapter is one sentence. So what do we have in this long sentence? There are actually two statements of fact at the beginning, and then there are three exhortations. Let's see if we can look at those, and we just read it, so in beginning with verse 19, we have then, my friends, complete freedom to go into the most holy place by means of the death of Jesus. He opened for us a new way, a living way, through the curtain, that is, to his own body. So, what's the first statement of fact? That we have a new way. Freedom. We have a new way, and it opens to us what? It opens a way into the most holy place in, in, in the heavenly sanctuary, right? And then two, right along with it, we have a great priest in charge of the house of God, and of course, who's that? Jesus. So, then we come to actually four exhortations, and your Bible, if it's like mine, will have let us, let us, let us. So let's see what they say. So let us come near to God. Now, who stayed in the most holy place in the ancient sanctuary? God. Yeah, that was the presence of God was in there, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. So if the way is open, we can come near to God. God. 
with a sincere heart and a sure faith, and with hearts that have been purified from a guilty conscience, and with bodies washed with clean water. And of course, those are the things that happen out at the gate. It's very interesting to observe, if you think about the sanctuary in the Old Testament, the very first thing that happens when you walk inside the outside gate, what happens first? What's the first thing you come to? The labor to get clean? No, labor's behind after the altar of burnt offering, okay? And what's the purpose of that altar? That's the place where the sacrifices take place. The forgiveness takes place, right? This is the place where the forgiveness takes place. God wants us to know right up front that when we come to meet with him, he forgives us. He doesn't have any problem with forgiveness whatsoever, okay? Right up front. That's one of the things we should have learned about the sanctuary. Then, let us hold on, uh, and let's finish that, in a sure faith. Now we can trust God. We have a relationship with God. And with hearts that have been purified with, from a guilty conscience, that's what the forgiveness is supposed to do. And with bodies washed with clean water, and Carrie, now we come to your labor. Okay, that's what comes next, second thing. Then, let us hold on firmly to the hope we profess because we can trust God to keep his promise. Why do you suppose he says that next? Well, I, I don't quite understand what it means to for us that we can enter the most holy place. Okay. That's kind of what we're talking about, but I'm trying to, to see exactly what it is that I can, what it is that I have opportunity now to do mm -hmm. personally. Okay, the, the symbolism would say that now you have the opportunity personally to approach God. Okay, so we didn't have that before? Well, what did the, Israel, did the Israelites have permission to go into the most holy place? No. no. Not at all. But they, they did they, have access to pray to God. Yes, and they had a mediator. The high priest. So it stood between them and God, and that's what they asked for. So when we're entering into the most holy place, is it is it that we're understanding what we're doing now? Presumably, hopefully, yes. And well, I, this is what we're talking about. We're mm -hmm. we're trying to understand. But you know, another thing, it, it kind of sounds like um, God is 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 being um, what conditioned for us. Mm -hmm. Or we are being conditioned for God. Hopefully, I should say that that's the goal. But also, you know, as you as you walk in and you forgive, isn't it like we should do this also? That of we that and as soon as we do things like God does, aren't we kind of entering into His? Exactly. That's what's supposed to happen. Okay. So so that's basically. For me, when I'm entering into the most holy place, I am acting like God. Yes. My translation puts it slightly differently. My help. By the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, 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 you know, we could, we could discuss this for a long time, but think about the implication. What does it mean by, to say, through his flesh? What is the implication of that? Crucifixion. Yeah. What, it's, what he's trying to say to us, if we understand why Jesus had to die, now that's a huge subject, if we understand why Jesus had to die, it should make us no longer afraid of God, no longer asking for a mediator. We should be comfortable with approaching God. That's what he's saying. Okay? Is everybody comfortable with that, or am I I'm extending things that, too far here? Well, let's, let's move on and see what else we can learn. Let us hold on firmly to the hope we profess because we can trust God to keep his promise. What's God's promise? What are his promise? Many of them, but what's he thinking about here? He's saying, I've opened a living way for you, right straight into the most holy place. Can we trust God to keep that promise? Is God trustworthy? I mean... Yeah. We go over to Revelation, I mean, if we were going to jump over to Revelation 14, 6 and 7, our famous three angels' messages, almost right up front, the first thing is God is 
worthy of our worship. He can be trusted, right? So he's, he's opening the way for us. Mm -hmm. The way is sacrifice. Well, the way is learning the truth about God through Jesus Christ. We, Which the way was opened when... was sacrifice because he is a forgiving God. Mm -hmm. And you forgive. You, you personally forgive people by, by sometimes sacrificing your, you know... Forgive whatever is making you angry. Yeah. So, in a way, um, you know, the sacrifice is, is something that's over different than anger. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. Takes the place of, mm -hmm. we, as we learn to be like Jesus, as we practice being like him, what happens? We're changed. We're, we're able to get over those things. We, we look at the life of Jesus and that understanding that life opens a new way for us. So then it goes on, number three, let us be concerned for one another to help un one another to show love and to do good. So as we feel more comfortable entering right into the presence of God, what are we supposed to do? Others. Put our arm around somebody else and help them, right? And then number four, let us not give up the habit of meeting together as some are doing. Instead, let us encourage one another all the more since you see that the day of the Lord is coming near. So, what are we supposed to do when we get together? Give each other support. Help each other, discuss scriptures, talk about, that's what we're doing here, right? Yes. Talking about the Bible, helping each other understand the Bible, raising questions. That's what we're supposed to do when we meet together. Well, what do we know about the background then of the book of Hebrews that might give us a little clue here. When was Hebrews written? Over 60 AD. Yeah. Yeah, almost certainly it was written by Paul. Uh, sometime, so Paul was, was, was beheaded sometime probably 67 or 68 AD. So this would have had to have been written in the 60s. Um, scholars suggest that it was written maybe about the same time Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon were written near the end of his first uh, imprisonment in Rome, which would have made it somewhere around probably 63, somewhere in there, A.D. So the Hebrews basically is, is a way to connect Jesus to the old religion. Well, I would put it, you had the right idea, but I would put it a little differently. I think Paul may have had an inkling the way things are going that Jerusalem and the temple in, Jer in Jerusalem were about to be destroyed by the Romans. And that happened in 70 AD. That happened in 70 AD. And I think he was saying, look at my Jewish Christian friends, the time has is is, is come for us to stop looking to some building in Jerusalem as the core, sort of key to our salvation. We need to raise our eyes and look to Jesus. So Jesus is our temple that we're talking about and what he's doing in heavenly sanctuary is what matters not something that happened back there in Jerusalem that's about to be destroyed of course that's something that had to happen I mean to to get to the next place yeah and the the destruction of Jerusalem seems to be providential in that that well okay change. and and by the way one of the reasons why most scholars are willing to admit that the book of Hebrews was written in the 60s is because a book that's so much about the sanctuary and so much about the Jewish worship would surely have said something about the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem if it had already happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, let's look at some of the details here. Hebrews 4, 16. What do you expect to see, what do you expect to happen as you look to the sanctuary in heaven? 4, 16. Let us have confidence then and approach God's throne where there is grace. Now, what was our first let us? It was already the same thing, wasn't it? The way is open to go right into God. And we're supposed to trust, have confidence that we can approach God's throne. There we will receive mercy and find great grace to help us just when we need it. Okay? So is there any reason to be frightened when we approach God's throne? No. Not at all. No, it's almost like Jesus. Jesus showed you mm -hmm. what God is like. Yep. You know, so don't be afraid. And again, 
Hebrews 6, starting with verse 19. We have this hope as an anchor for our lives. It is safe and sure and goes through the curtain of the heavenly temple into the inner sanctuary. Once again, what are we talking about? Entering the most holy place at God, in God's presence, right? On our behalf, Jesus has gone in there before us and has become a high priest forever and the priestly order of Melchizedek. So now you're all going to explain to me exactly why he's talking about the order of Melchizedek. He's a king and a priest. Yes, very important point. Melchizedek, the name Melchizedek means king of righteousness, and he's also called the king of Salem, which of course was the earlier name for Jerusalem. Salem means peace. The king of righteousness, the king of peace. And what did he do to, for Abraham? He blessed Abraham. He blessed Abraham him. Came back with he, the loot. He acts. He act like acted like a priest of God, blessing Abraham. So here is a person who's a king and a priest, and he antedates Levi, and so therefore antedates uh, antedates Aaron and, and and antedates Levi. So clearly he's superior to them. He takes precedence over them. And in a sense, he even antedated Father Abraham. In a sense, yes. He's, he's actually the figure that actually completes the opposite of the separation of church and state, mm -hmm. if you really think about it. Because he's, he is a person that brings them together truthfully without one opposing the other. So, well, and, and Jesus is the ultimate person that does that. Mm -hmm. But if you have the right kind of person, in that position, you're okay. Which if you have the wrong, yet, yeah. <laughs> if you're in the wrong kind of person, it's big time trouble. Right. Yeah. So, so now I ask you the most important question: Are you? Do you feel comfortable in approaching the throne of God because you have a mediator there pleading on your behalf, or do you feel comfortable approaching the throne of God because you realize? what kind of a person Jesus has revealed the Father to be. And you've read John 16, 25 to 27, which I will read for you right now. I have used figures of speech. This is Jesus at the very end of his ministry on this earth. I have used figures of speech to tell you these things, but the time will come when I will not use figures of speech, but it will speak to you plainly about the Father. Now, what should the disciples have said right at that point? Give us that information now. Please. That's what we have needed all this time. Plainly about the Father, this ought to be the most important thing Jesus said his whole life, right? When that day comes, he says, you will ask him in my name, and I do not say that I will ask him on your behalf, but the Father himself loves you. What's the most important thing Jesus said about his Father? He loves us. He loves us. And therefore, it's not necessary for him to... Plead. Plead with the Father on our behalf. So, the Father loves us, the Holy Spirit loves us. Of course, this raises more questions. So, yes. what does the pleading that we have referred to in many places of Scripture and Ellen White, what then does it refer to? Okay, well, let's talk about that. That's a fair question. You might be getting into that later. I, I will, Well, we're going to touch on it a few times, but we might as well just deal with it up front. And let's, let me put the question to all of you. I'm not the only one who's supposed to have any answers here. But I, I, I suspect there's several reasons. One, first of all, would be what's found in Exodus uh, 20, verses 18 to 20. And let's just look at that in case you have forgotten. Exodus 20, verses 18 through 20. Now, those of you who are familiar with the Ten Commandments know that they're found where? immediately before that. Yeah, Exodus 20 verses, there's an introduction and there's verses 3 to 17 is the Ten Commandments. Immediately, and of course that was given from the top of Mount Sinai with the black cloud and the lightning and the mountain shaking and the loud voice, the booming noise and all that kind of stuff. Immediately following that come these verses. When the people heard the thunder and the trumpet blast and saw the lightning and the smoky mountain, they trembled with fear and stood a long way off. I mean, what would you do? They said to Moses, if you speak to us, we will listen. But we are afraid that if God speaks to us, 
we will die. So what do they ask for? The mediator. Someone to plead with. Them. Someone to stand between them and God. And Moses replied, don't be afraid. God has only come to test you. My version says, it, the original says, to, make, to put the fear of God in you and make you keep on obeying. I guess it's keep on obeying him is put the fear of you so that you will not sin. But the people continued to stand a long way off and only Moses went near the dark cloud where God was. So I suspect that part of the reason there's all this pleading language in the Bible is because there's a lot of people who are still standing way over there and they don't want to come close to God. And God says, okay, if you don't understand me well enough yet, don't worry, there's someone here who will plead on your behalf. I, I, I sincerely believe that that's a concession to our, our fears and our misunderstandings of God. Isn't it also showing the fact that Jesus hadn't arrived yet? No. Because um, Jesus We'd is like the one so. that showed mm -hmm. who the Father is, and frankly, if nobody shows you who he is, you see all that rumbling and stuff, I'd stay away from it too. Okay, so, so then the next question is, who was the God of the Old Testament? Jesus. Whoa, where did you get that idea? 1 Corinthians uh, 10.4. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 10. We'll read the first four verses. I want you to remember, my brothers and sisters, now this, of course, is Paul writing, what happened to our ancestors who followed Moses? They were all under the protection of the cloud and all passed safely through the Red Sea. In the cloud and in the sea, they were all baptized as followers of Moses. Now, is there any question about what he's talking about, what time period he's talking about here? I mean, it's perfectly obvious, right? All ate the same spiritual bread. What was their bread that they ate? The manna, or manna as we usually manna. say. And drank the same spiritual drink. What, water did, what did they drink out there? They, they drank water that came from those miraculous springs that God produced out there, right? They drank from the spiritual rock that went with them, and that rock was Christ, Christ himself. So who was it out there in the desert? Now some people can say, well, maybe that's not the whole story. Well, let's try another verse. What did Jesus himself say? John 5, 39. He said to the scribes and the Pharisees, the, the experts in Scripture, you study the Scriptures because you think that in them you will find eternal life. And these very Scriptures speak about my Father. So They speak about me. Christ himself said that. And then, of course, probably the most important one is, is found after Jesus had uh, actually died and rose again, and he's speaking to his um, disciples in Luke 24, 44, and he's, he's, he's telling them that now, the, this message, then he said to them, these are the very things I told you about while I was still with you. Everything written about me and the law of Moses, that would be the five books of Moses. The writings of the prophets, that's the second section of the Hebrew Bible, which included um, Joshua, Judges, and the major prophets, and so forth. And the Psalms, and that's not just talking about the Psalms, but they're all the books that went along. There, there are three divisions of the Old Testament in the Hebrew Bible. It's all the same books that we have, the, the 39 books of the Old Testament, but they're just organized a little bit different. And so Jesus has said, from the beginning of the Old Testament to the end of the Old Testament, who's it talking about? Jesus. Jesus. Me. Jesus is saying me. It's talking about me. So I don't see any way for us to escape the fact that the God of the Old Testament that so, a lot of people are so much afraid of was Jesus. Now it seems like there's something a little inconsistent here. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at the life of Jesus... You never see him going up and telling the army to destroy everybody, men, women, and children. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a lot of stuff, stone this person to death, and all that, all through the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And you don't see that happening with Jesus Yeah. In, when, when he was down here. Okay. So that has to be rectified somehow. Okay, Gary, let me just ask you a question. Suppose I said, okay... I would like to really know what you're like. I really want to get you to know as a person. But I'm only going to look at you when you're at work. Am I getting a complete picture of you? 
Well, be yeah, honest I now. You, I see what you're saying, but um, okay. wasn't Jesus working all the time? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I just picked the working. At, at, yeah, he, I know. Of course, I he worked all the way through. But, but I'm saying, what, what I'm saying is you can't just take one little piece of, of, the, of the story of the Christ in the Bible and say, well, we're going to focus on this piece. You have to take all of it. Hebrews 1. Yeah. I mean, in, in various ways. Yeah. Okay, so um, are you are you saying that um, Jesus, the Old Testament and Jesus, you have to put them together? That's exactly what to, I'm saying. Yeah, but why didn't Jesus show <laughs> some sort of indication of that other part of him? He did. Read Where, the Minor Prophets. Well, read Isaiah. Not, read not Jeremiah. While he was down here doing his ministry. He, he didn't seem to... He didn't kill didn't anybody. He didn't uh, tell anybody to go out and stone yeah, anybody. Yeah, remember, remember um, when that city went and kind of um, um, pushed them off, you know, and the, and the disciples said, should we call fire and cut yeah, down no, on them? And he says, no, no. don't yeah. do that. Yeah. Okay, he's kind of not acting like he did back then because you got Sodom and Gomorrah okay. that did all kinds of terrible things and that... Fire rain down on that. Yeah. So, wh well, what's if happening look, here? If you look in the Old Testament, and now this is not a study of the Old Testament, but you look at the Old Testament and the times when fire rained down from heaven were times when God was being directly challenged. You look at, for example, the Egyptian plagues. I mean, how could it be worse than that? And what was that? Exodus 12, verse 12 just says, this was a direct challenge from the Egyptian gods against the God of heaven. They, they, they thought this Jewish God, God was hopeless, totally hopeless because look at his people have been, in, have been slaves for a hundred years. See, what kind of a God is that? God says, okay, I'll, I'll show you what kind of a God I am. Okay, but one more point though. Yeah. Um, you know, you're saying that Jesus wasn't directly challenged when he was here on earth? He, he just chose to, he chose to meet, meet it in a different way when he was here on this earth. So can't, can't you look at it in the way that we look at our children? Sure. I mean, when they're young, you give them a spanking when they're bad. You can't do that with a teenager. You have to use another way of getting through. I mean, you don't teenager. think it would work too well? It, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I can see that. I see what you're saying, but um, the Old Testament people were were children and the yes. New Testament in people some ways were yes. teenagers. The children of Israel in the will, coming out of Egyptian slavery, slavery they Maybe. were Maybe. they were babes. Yeah. They knew almost nothing except to listen to their master, okay. who I who see, whipped them that, or killed them. Side, yeah. Power is the only yeah. thing they, they understood. A yeah. little further down from where you read, it said, "We must not put Christ to the test, as some of them did, and were destroyed by serpents." Yeah. Christ's time was a different era and the Jewish nation was, had been established and the religion had yep. been established and they'd ignored it, but it was a different thing. Yeah. Highly. Jesus did say, though, if Sodom and Gomorrah heard and saw what they were seeing now, they would have repented. Exactly. So, um, well, let me, okay. let me give you the other side of the coin now. You brought up several things. Fair enough. Look at John, chapter 17, the prayer of Jesus just before he was arrested and you know, tried and crucified. John 17, I'm going to come down to verse 20. Now, Jesus in John 17 prays first for himself, then he prays for his immediate disciples, and then he prays for us. And that starts in verse 20. I pray not only for them, but also for those who believe in me because of their message. How many does that include? Mm -hmm. Certainly, hopefully, it includes all of us, right? We believe in the message because of their, wit their testimony. Father, may they be in us just as you are in me and I am in you. May they be one so that the world believe that you sent me. Jesus is saying that he wants us to be as close to him as he is to the Father. Can you imagine that kind of a relationship? That's just, it just blows me away to think about it. Well, we know there are many passages of Scripture. This is what Gary's been talking about in the writings. They're only right to refer to pleading. And there's a lot of talk about intercession and mediation. And how do we understand, for example, let me give, here's an example. This is that, uh, the book, That I May Know Him, page 78, written by Ellen White. What does intercession comprehend? 
It is the golden chain which binds finite man to the throne of the infinite God. The human agent whom Christ has died to save importunes, that means pleads or asks for the throne or, or pleads for the throne of God. And his petition is taken up by Jesus who has purchased him with his own blood. Our great high priest places his righteousness on the side of the sincere suppliant and the prayer of Christ blends with that of the human petitioner. And if you're scared to death of God, those are comforting words. I think that's, what's, that's why they're written. That's what they intended to be. So I ask the question again, which gives you greater hope? The idea that someone's there pleading for you or the idea that it's not necessary any longer for someone to plead? The latter, because in, in reality, I never believed the former. Mm -hmm. I still, I don't believe Jesus is there just pleading God. I never believed that. Okay. So I have no problem. So you were always an unbeliever, huh? I'm always, I'm a <laughs> believer. <laughs> I think, I kind of see it, how can you split it? Because they're yeah. interrelated. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. And we hope that every, anybody who has even a fear of God will actually eventually grow up to a place where they're not afraid of God anymore. Um, so look at verse 22. So he, the, this is pictures of God meeting people where they are. Yes. Where we all are at different stages. Mm -hmm. This person needs God pleading, or Jesus pleading for them. This person needs something else. Greater understanding. Yeah. And yeah. you can also look at it as, okay, you're pleading towards God, to God, but actually what he's doing is pleading to God because the people that he's pleading for are hard-headed yeah and so he's pleading for 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 them actually he's by pleading to god that somehow get through this hard-headed yeah. part he, he's really trying to plead with us to get us to understand god mm -hmm. that's most of his job so now verse 22 so let us come this is hebrews 10 again so let us come near to god with a sincere heart and a sure faith with hearts that have been purified from a guilty conscience, that says you've passed through the, you've gone through the sacrifices, you've you passed by the, excuse me, the altar of burnt offering, and you've passed the labor, bodies washed with clean water. So now you're ready to enter the sanctuary, right? So notice what we're supposed to do. There's four things we must do. Come to him with a sincere heart. Of course, this does not imply that we are already perfect. It simply implies that we honestly want a growing relationship with him. So what is it that Christ is really looking for in the saints? What's he looking for? Willingness. Is he going to say, okay, I'm only going to, I'm only going to admit to heaven people who are perfectly, perfectly perfect? No. Who's he, what's he waiting for? What's he looking he will for? listen and learn. Those who will listen and learn. Looking for people who will listen and learn? Fair enough. Anything else? Your friends. Yeah, people who want to become God's friends. Exactly. So they're on a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, right? That's what that's all about. You know, if, if, they're, if they're forgiving people, mm -hmm. if they're taking up Jesus' idea of forgiveness and they actually are putting it into their lives mm -hmm. in a way they're kind of cleaning themselves aren't yep. they so that they can move closer into God because he is that end mm -hmm. so the next step too they're supposed to come with confidence built upon faith confidence built on fun faith is a little confusing to me because confidence and faith are the same word in the, in the New Testament but anyway confidence built upon faith and remember that faith is built upon evidence that evidence is founded in the inspired records that are now so easily available to us. I mean, we sit here and I can just push a button and just skim over the whole Bible. I can go back and forth. I can push a button and it turns the pages for me. I just sit back and, and read. I mean, how could it be any easier? I can go instantly wherever I want to go in the Bible. I can see commentaries and other Bibles. I don't like this translation. I can look at a different translations. I mean, how could we have it any easier than that? Right? Um, so, Ex read Exodus 24.8. Let's look, getting some more ideas. Exodus 24.8. Then Moses took the blood in the bowls and threw it on the people. 
He said, this is the blood that seals the covenant which the Lord made with you when he gave all these commands. What's he talking about when he said made, made all these commands? Ten commandments, I guess. Okay, uh, that would be the basis. And he said other things. Yeah. Whatever he told them to do from the mountain at the yeah. foot of Mount Sinai, right? They were at the foot, he was up there. Okay, so let's look at what else he says. Look at Leviticus 8 now, a little while later. Moses killed it. Uh, this talking about the sacrifice here and took some of the blood and put it on the lobe of Aaron's right ear on the thumb of his right hand and on the big toe of his right foot then he brought Aaron's sons forwards and put some of the blood on their lobes of their right ears and the thumbs of their right hands and on the big toes of their right feet Moses then threw the rest of the blood on all four sides of the altar so what's he doing? Covering them with a the sacrifice, I guess. Okay, he's he's dedicating them to do the work they're supposed to do, and so ear, hand, foot. What do those things mean? What you hear, what you do, what you want. Doing, God. Yeah, God, please guide these people in what they hear, what they do, and where they go. Right? But why on the right side? Well, because that's the side of God's blessing. So the the people are gathered when they then they separate the the sheep from the goats. Mm -hmm. You've got the right and left side. Okay, one side has the blood on it, which it's, is the promise. It's interesting and, that, and I am not trying to throw dispersions on any group of people, but if you go to the Islamic world, the blessed side is the left side. It is. Is that because they read the other direction? I don't know, but to some them... <laughs> Jewish, some Jewish things as well. Some of it's tied mm. into hygiene, too, particularly with yeah. Islam. Yeah. yeah. Basic desert hygiene. Yeah. Okay. So, he goes on to say, this is an illustration, now we're looking at Hebrews 9, verse 9. This is an illustration that points to the present time and means that the offerings and animal sacrifices presented to God cannot make the worshiper's heart perfect. Now, we know that already, don't we? Well, drop down to verse 13, same chapter. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a burnt calf are sprinkled on the people who are ritually unclean, and this purifies them by taking away their ritual impurity. So this is a symbolic act. Does it really all of a sudden take care of everything? No. I mean, what if we could go through some kind of ritual and maybe get some ashes out of it and so forth, and I can sprinkle it around here on the table and make all of you perfectly clean from your sins. That'd be, that would be valuable stuff, right? And we ought to do it every day, right? Yeah. Well, there's a meaning to it. Yeah. That's what you're trying to do, is understanding mm -hmm. the meaning. And when you do the, the actual thing, it's, it's like you're saying it. Mm -hmm. Only you're doing it with through actions. Okay. So, how there, there's, no longer, there's no longer necessary for us to burn sacrifices, to sacrifice lambs. In our day, we need to understand what Christ was actually trying to accomplish through those ancient ceremonies and come to God honestly with a clear conscience. That is what it means to come with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. And then verse and number four, come with our bodies washed with pure water. And look what the New Testament says about that, Ephesians 5.26. He did this to dedicate the church to God by his word after making it clean by washing it in water. What's the symbolism there? Jesus. Water is always a cleansing agent, isn't it? And the idea is the church itself needs cleansing, right? Spiritual washing comes about not only through baptism and our repeated dedication to our baptismal vows through the ordinance of humility, but also through reading our Bibles and drawing closer to God through the application of biblical principles. Well, look at James 4, 7 and 8. How does this fit in? So then, submit to God, resist the devil, and be, he will run away from you. Come near to God. We've already talked about the way which has been opened into the most holy place. That's how we come to God, right? And he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you hypocrites. So, is it just washing the hands that we need to do? No, we need to purify our hearts, right? So, do we make great professions on the Sabbath and pursue worldly interests during the rest of the week? 
Only God can change all of that. But he will change us only if we allow him to do so. We must make certain painful choices. And what of these painful choices? Like God, we must learn to be loving instead of selfish. It's so natural for us as human beings to follow the example of Satan and be selfish. We must learn to be loving all the, all the time, always. We must model our lives after Jesus Christ instead of Satan. We must put God first in everything. We need to recognize that this is the best thing we can do for ourselves. The best thing we can do for God or for who? <laughs> for ourselves. For ourselves. What, what, why is doing God's will the best thing we can do for ourselves? It's the best way to live. It's the best way to live. Yeah. It's the maximum benefit comes to us if we live that kind of a life. Now, a selfish being would never admit that, not initially, right? So in light of all that, do you feel comfortable in coming boldly with confidence at the throne of God? Yes. <laughs> I had fear of God, but it wasn't because of the Bible. It's because, you know, like you have parents who just put it in, oh, do it. But I, <laughs> yeah, they want to terrify oh, you. Your mom. <laughs> yeah. She changed later. <laughs> <laughs> well, or do you think you need to go through Jesus first and have him speak to the Father on your behalf? Yeah. yeah. Haven't we made any progress at all since the foot of Mount Zion? <laughs> yeah. Well, the book of Hebrews is full of comments about trust, faith, confidence, and hope. And there's a lot of these. We won't take time to read them. Hebrews 3, 6 and verse 14. Chapter 4, verse 16. Chapter 6, verse 11. Chapter 11, verse 1. The sort of definition of faith, if you understand it correctly. Do these texts encourage you? What do they imply about how we should live our lives as Christians? Well, let's ask a question. Does faith lead to confidence? Yes. It does. Absolutely. Does our relationship with God and getting to know Him better give us greater confidence in His love and, and care for us? Absolutely. I wish, I thought about doing this, and maybe it's something we ought to work on sometime as a group. Going through the Bible and making a note of all the times when God has promised something and then he's done it. Promise, done it. Promise, done it. Promise, done it. Prophecies, etc. Even over thousands of years, he promises, he does it. How, how reliable is that? I mean, how many times is, do we know of any places where he's failed? Well, there are some conditional prophecies. So we need to take those into account. The, the only thing that I think of, true, he always comes through, but it sometimes it's went in between time, like with Job, mm -hmm. where there's a lot of stuff he has to go through before he finally comes through. Okay. And uh, that, that uh, is something that people should look at also. And it's very interesting that we're not the only ones involved in this thing. If you read Ephesians 1, 7 to 10, and 3, 7 to 10, and Colossians 1, 19 and 20, you learn something very interesting. I'm going to read just Ephesians 3, verse 10 as a sort of summary of much of that. God has done everything he's done here on this earth in order that at the present time, by means of the church, how many does that include of us? How many of us? That's all of us, right? We all claim to be church members. The angelic rulers and powers in the heavenly world might learn of his wisdom in all its different forms. The angelic beings standing around God's throne are supposed to learn something about him from us. How does that happen? <laughs> well, we were created in his image, and now we're going yeah. through what we're doing on this earth. Why so does that they mean? are watching us. Yeah. Um, how it turns out on the end will we'll tell them more about God. Yeah, we're not the only ones who need to learn about God through faith and the evidence provided through Scripture. There are some very important questions about God that were answered by, his, by the life and death of Jesus which couldn't be answered in any other way. And that, of course, the life and death of Jesus is part of the church story here on this earth. 
well, that's one thing that the law can't do. Yeah. Uh, the law is just text, and you, you have to read it, you have to interpret it. Um, Jesus was actually the law living, mm -hmm. and when you look at his life, you are actually looking at something greater than that text. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, the, the law is still, the text is still the truth, but, but there's nothing more, I mean, Jesus is, is way greater than in presentation. Yeah. Now we've talked about various ways in which the way is opened for us through the body of Christ into God's presence. Look at 1 Timothy 3 verse 13. Those helpers who do their work well win for themselves a good standing and are able to speak boldly about their faith in Christ Jesus. So God is saying, if you follow my will for your lives and you are gradually being transformed, becoming more like, more like me, what are you going to do? You're going to be able to walk right up there and give God give God a hug. I know there's a lot of people who don't feel what comfortable. What a concept! Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Cool. In light of all that, what challenge, challenges do you see to your faith? What are the biggest stumbling blocks that's, that you can see affecting Christians? Hmm. Stumbling block to your faith. Yeah. It's all around you. <laughs> yeah. The biggest stumbling block probably could be spelled in the name of one person. Satan. He, does he want you to, to develop your faith? Absolutely not. What happens if a whole group of people develop the right kind of faith and begin to cling together and, and represent God correctly at the end of this earth's history? What happens to Satan? Finished. He's finished. Well, he gets pretty angry. Isn't well, not only that, it's it's the beginning of the end for him, isn't it? Now, sure, there's a thousand years still to go, but that's a lonely time. Right? Mm -hmm. So God and his devil is going to do everything possible to keep us from developing that kind of faith. But what exactly, in grand terms, does he do to do that? He convinces you not to read your Bible. He occupies your mind with a million other things as far as possible. Keep keeps you so busy you don't have time to pray or think about God. Yeah, I, do I need to go on? He 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 presents all. He spends billions of dollars in Hollywood developing movies that just seem so attractive to the young people, and they think, why would I read this, you know, fuddy duddy old book one? I mean, look at all the exciting stuff that Hollywood's producing. So if right? you read your Bible. Then you got him whipped. Well, uh, he doesn't. He doesn't attack you anymore. <laughs> no, he'll attack you more. <laughs> yeah, but then, then how does he do it? It, it comes it, down to a basic thing. If you don't want his wares, you don't go into his shop. Yeah, which is a hard thing to do, but it kind of brings what you're saying. Yeah. Well, do you feel comfortable holding on with hope, confidence, assurance, and confession to the Lord Jesus Christ through the relationship of faith? Now, there's a lot of words all put together in one sentence. Do we need to have confidence in our own Christian experience or only confidence in what Jesus Christ has done for us? Hmm. I have to be really careful here because this, hmm. this is a troubling one. Hmm. Well, as we look through the stories in the Bible, we find many times when God's promises have proven true even though his people were facing apparently impossible circumstances. Consider the case of Abraham and Sarah. What was the chances under any normal circumstances for, Abra for, for Sarah to have a baby at age 90? She's long since, having her, since stopped having periods. What are her chances of having a baby? No. <laughs> Nil. And what happened? She had a baby. Well, what about his promise to bring the Israelites back to Palestine after the Babylonian captivity? Did it look like it was going to happen? I mean, look at, look at Daniel's prayer in Daniel 9. You see, man, this looks impossible. Not only did it look impossible, but he said it would happen in 70 years, and it did. Mm -hmm. Exactly. What about his promise to take the children of Israel out of Egypt, Egyptian slavery, back in the beginning, in the early history? Did he get them out of Egypt? He sure enough did. What about his promise to come again? Yeah. Well, that's exactly the point. 
<laughs> if, if someone promises you dozens and dozens of times and every time they have proven, their promise has proven exactly correct, what are the chances that his future promises are going to work? Mm-hmm. If you, um, let, let's take a, a, a human example. Suppose that someone says, you know, I can tell you how to make money in the stock market. So you go, eh, yeah, I've heard that story before, right? But suppose it's okay, you do this and you do this, okay, and you make money. And then every day, he's, every day he says, do this and this, and you make money. After a while, you say, well, huh? He must have, he must have some kind of a secret going for him, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm just, I'm just asking, right? Now, you, you got to make sure that everybody knows that's just an illustration. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, sure, but I mean, yeah. I think we've seen Don't enough. Don't like Martha Stewart. We've seen enough in history, more recent history, and we're seeing enough now to tell us that the signs are getting yeah. more frequent and it's Boy, closer. aren't they ever. Well, now the last two verses in our, in our passage. Let us be concerned for one another to help one another to show good, uh, show, to show love and to do good. Let us not give up the habit of meeting together as some of are doing. Instead, let us encourage one another all the more since you see the day of the Lord is coming nearer. Christianity was never intended to be a solitary experience. Although we have spoken about the individual experience, it must also happen in the context of the group. Love, which is the characteristic of God's government, does not happen individually or individualistically. We need to learn how to get along with our friends and associates. We even need to learn to love our enemies. Remember Jesus' statement in Matthew 5, 43 to 45. It is only in the context of community that love and good deeds can show themselves. Should Christians return to a major incentive for Christian, should Christ return, I'm sorry, be a major incentive, incentive for Christian behavior? Is it fear of what might happen to us at the second coming that is to motivate us to action? No. Ellen White has these very interesting words. The shortness of time is frequently urged as an incentive for seeking righteousness and making Christ our friend. This should not be the great motive with us, for it savors of selfishness. Is it necessary that the terrors of the day of God should be held before us, that we may be compelled to right action through fear? It ought not to be so. Jesus is attractive. Mm-hmm. That was originally written, Review and Herald, August 2, 1881, paragraph 6. So, can you think of someone in your Sabbath school class, your church, or among your friends who needs encouragement right now? What can you do to help build the faith of those around you? And now I quote another passage. The mediator in his office and work would greatly exceed in dignity and glory the earthly typical priesthood. This Savior was to be a mediator, to stand between the Most High and His people. Through this provision, a way was opened whereby the guilty sinner might find access to, the God, to God through the mediation of another. The sinner could not come in his own person with his guilt upon him and with no greater merit than he possessed in himself. Christ alone could open the way by making an offering equal to the demands of the divine law. He was perfect and undefiled by sin. He was without spot or blemish. The extent of the terrible consequences of sin could never have been known had not the remedy provided been of infinite value. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 2, page 11. What does that mean? Is it, I mean, I think we all should be moved by the fact that the Christ, the value, the value of his sacrifice was an infinite value. Um, do you feel like that somehow gives you complete access to God at, any, at this point in time? Well, what point do you quit forgiving? You quit giving sacrifice? No, you don't. You don't? Okay. Not on this world, if that's seven. what you mean. 70 times 7 or 7 mm-hmm. times 7. 70 times 70. 77 times <laughs> whatever. Uh, well, God emptied all of heaven, giving himself as our substitute and surety. We've talked about those words. We have discussed these questions before, but in this context, what do they mean? As we associate with others of like faith, does it help to grow our faith? Does it keep us from going off in the wrong directions? I certainly hope so. 
we learn from each other, I hope, when we come together like this. What is it about the life and death of Jesus Christ that gives us confidence? Is it because we believe that our high priest is now pleading on our behalf in heaven? Our famous question. Or is it because we believe that he has, he has fully and completely answered all the accusations and questions raised by Satan down through the generations? Do we see God pictured clearly enough in Scripture so that we have no reason left to doubt? Does it help to build our faith when we encourage others, help the weak, and try to explain the reasons for our faith? Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 suggests that we should fellowship together. What does that mean to you? Do you think first of Sabbath potlucks? Well, that would, that would be a good thing, right? Or a Bible study together. Shouldn't social gatherings be an opportunity for witnessing and learning together? So what, we have learned from, what have we learned from this series of lessons? There should be not be any question about the fact that the author of Hebrews considered Jesus to be superior in every way to anything or anybody else. He is superior to angels, to the heavenly priests, to the ancient priests, even to Moses, and to anything and anyone else we could name. We've looked at Hebrews 2 and verse 4. What do these verses say to you? Do we, do we need to worry that God doesn't understand us, so therefore Jesus had to come down and experience the difficult things we went through? Surely we're not back there at that point. Do we accept the teachings of Romans 8, 26, and 31 to 39 about how we are to relate to the Holy Spirit, the Father, and the Son? All three members of the Godhead are on our side. And who's opposing us? Satan. Satan. Do you feel confident with all three members of the Godhead on your side when you have to face Satan? Mm -hmm. We should, shouldn't we? <laughs> we should. Well, what does the book of Hebrews tell us about the work of the Holy Spirit? This says a lot about it in there. Hebrews 2, 4, 3, 7, 6, 4, 9, 18, and 14. I'm saying 9, 8, and 14, 10, 15, and 29. So why is it that at the end of such a great book, Paul has to end up with these two verses, Hebrews 10, 31. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And then a couple of chapters over, Hebrews 12, 29. Let me call that up for you really quick. Because our God is indeed a destroying fire. What we have learned this three months, I hope, has been an encouragement to you. I hope you've listened carefully and you've been able to share and learned as much as we have. May you have a wonderful new year. We'll see you next year.